This is the Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. In this podcast, you will hear the verse-by-verse teaching and preaching of Pastor Kevin Akana. Learn more about our church from our website at windwardbaptist.org. Turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10, the reign of Jehu. So we looked at a man named Jehu, who was, who God has chosen. Now, the, this, this king Jehu was not, I would say, a very godly person. But just like we looked in the Bible and studied how, in the past, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. God called, um, was it King Cyrus, his servant. And these are not, these are pagan kings. In other words, God could use anyone. And God could use you, and God could use me. He can use anyone. That's by the grace of God. Praise the Lord for that. We just have to be submissive and and willing to serve him. So we look at 2 Kings chapter 10. We'll see that God is cleaning house and he's using. He's using a man named Jehu, who was anointed king. We seen that last week in the in that Jehu, when he approached the woman Jezebel, he wasn't very impressed by her makeup or her beauty, and he just asked, "Who's on the Lord's side?" And those eunuchs threw her over, and um, she fell and went splat. And this is a wicked woman, one of the most wicked women in the Bible. You don't know too many, probably you don't know any women named Jezebel. But I don't know, maybe you do. Does anyone know a woman named Jezebel? I mean, you might have a a cat you named Jezebel. But you wouldn't probably name your daughter Jezebel. And so Jehu is not finished. So we know that God pronounced judgment upon Ahab and his descendants that they are all going to be put to death. And so we see that God is going to use Jehu to clean house. And so the first thing we see is we see enacting judgment, incomplete obedience, and insincere worship. That's our points. Second Kings chapter 10. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. That's a lot of sons. <laughs> and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria under the rulers of Jezreel to the elders and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, So obviously Ahab was not able to raise up all of these sons. So he had people that raised them up for him. So the letters were sent to them, those that were raising up Ahab's children. And the letter said this, verse 2. Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are... And there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also and armor. Look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. So he challenges them. He says, let's do this. Let's get ready to rumble. In this corner, we have Jehu, the king of Israel. Well, they're not going to want to do that. They knew that they would be in trouble. He says, look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid. I mean, they seen what Jehu had been doing. He was a very intimidating person. 
And they didn't want to do that, which is wise of them. So he says, okay, well, there's another option for you. <laughs> Some of you already know the story. But they were exceedingly afraid. You know, um, sometimes people think that the Bible is boring. <laughs> One thing the Bible is not. It is not boring. <laughs> you read through the Bible and you, you, know, you, you, see the, you read about these stories. In fact, there's a lot of movies and books that are written, and movies that have been made based on the biblical themes of the Bible. In fact, probably most of the old Disney, the new Disney, they just they's lost their mind. I mean, they're gone, or is, <laughs> Disney is gone. But the olden days before, I mean, the stories were all, you know, it was, you had the princess, and then there was, you know, you had the, you had the, the king and the queen, and they had a little cute princess, and then there was a curse pronounced upon the land, and the princess was going to die or something, and then now the prince had to go and defeat the, or you had the wicked persons, usually like uh, some kind of a stepmother or something. <laughs> And there was a curse pronounced, and then you have the prince who's got to defeat the the evil stepmother and kiss the the princess, and so that she can wake up. But nowadays, what the the princess says, "Oh, I don't need no prince." <laughs> Someone sent me a, a like a, those little videos reels, and I forget who sent it to me, but it was showing about the new, I guess, a new Snow White or a new Disney film where the actress who's, I don't know if it's Snow White or or who it is, saying that, um, yeah, this is is how Disney, you know, this is the story before, you know, I mean, it's not like the 1930s where the, she portrays the princess, where the princess needs a prince to kiss her and this and that. No, this this princess doesn't doesn't need a man. She has her own dreams, and she, she's her own. I forget what, what she had said. I thought, <laughs> it just not, it's just not like what it used to be. Yeah. Go woke, go, woke, go broke. And I know that there's been a, a lot of these Disney um, films that, that have been doing terrible and good because they're they're dumb. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Everyone's entitled to an opinion, right? I think the very, very um, not not just woke, but not even entertaining. Yeah, it's not even entertaining. But a lot of these themes really come from the Bible, and we see that the Bible is a intriguing. In the Bible, it's, you see, I mean, human nature is the same back then in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you have. You see uh, um, Cain killing his brother, right? You have, you know, uh, um, brothers, you know, you, have, you see murder, you see um, adultery, you see um, lying. I mean, just human nature is from, you know, sin came into this world and it's a cursed world. And as a result, we'll be separated from God for all of eternity. But then you have, of course, the hero of the story, you know, and, and the Bible is God's redemption story. It's a beautiful uh, story of God redeeming mankind, fallen man, and coming down from heaven and he's, as he is the hero. And we know that every story you have to have love. And in love, true love, there has to be sacrifice, right? And then, of course, then the curse will be lifted. In. So the Bible is an exciting book. And as we look into this chapter, we see that here you have a hero, although he's not He's not a great hero, okay, this guy Jehu. But we see that he comes on the scene and he starts to, he's used of God to clean up the nation of the worship of Baal, of Baal worship. So the first point, enacting judgment. Judgment has to be enacted. You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. There's going to be, you know, the Bible says that that your sin will find you out. There's going to be judgment. You're going you're gonna to pay the price. 
The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow it, that shall he also reap. I just talked to somebody the other day, and, and they said that all of their life, they was running from, they were running from the will of God. Like they heard it, they, they understand it, but they just didn't want to do it, didn't think it was the best way to live. And as they have gotten older, they see that the will of God and doing God's will is the best way to live. Sometimes, sometimes we think that righteousness and holiness is boring. I mean, isn't that what the, the lie that the devil tried to get across to Eve in the garden? He's trying to tell Eve that God doesn't want you to live. I mean, if you do what I say, then you're going you're gonna to live. But he wants you to be oppressed. But if you just listen to me, just do what you want. You become your own God. And he tempted her, right? You, you cannot eat of all of the trees I mean, there's a, a, there's a tree that God is, is uh, holding back. Oh, man, that's because he doesn't want you to enjoy your life. And he dangles that in front, of, in front of Eve, right? Here, eat the fruit. Just like he'll dangle in front of people. He'll dangle things, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Drink this. Everyone's doing it. Smoke this. Commit that affair, you know, that adultery or fornication. And we'll find always in the end that God is true and let every man be a liar. So judgment has to be enacted. The nation of Israel thought the grass was greener on the other side because you had the cedars of Lebanon and, and uh, Lebanon was so green and that's because the Baals watered it. And if we just worship Baal, we'll have green grass too. No. Now look, they're in such a predicament here in the, in the nation. So the enacting of judgment. Where are we? Okay. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria and to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and they are, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also in armor. Look even out the best and meetest of your master's son, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. And they were afraid. They didn't want to do it. And he said, Behold, two kings... Stood not before him. How then shall we stand? He said, these two kings were wiped out. The kings were wiped out by Jehu. So how are, how are we going to stand? They were afraid. So he said, okay, there's option number two. Verse five. And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers up of the children... <laughs> That's their title, the bringers up of the children. You the parents, you the guardians, we are the bringers up of the children. Okay. And that's who they were. They sent to Jehu saying, we are thy servants and we will do all that thou bid us. We will not make any king. Do thou that which is good in thine eyes. They're basically saying, we're, we don't want to go to war with you, Jehu. We've seen what you did to these kings. The king of Israel, dead. The king of Judah, dead. We're going to just do whatever you want. We're your servants. We're not trying to make anybody, we're not trying to oppose you. We want to come by, uh, we want to submit to you, and we want to serve you. So Jehu says, okay, you want to serve me? This is what you need to do. So this is what you need to do. You guys know what it is already? <laughs> you know, yeah, Pastor Mark. Get ahead of the story. <laughs> you want to get ahead of the story. <laughs> Verse 6. Now he wrote a letter, another letter. He, he liked to write. <laughs> you know, nowadays just writing a letter is, is difficult, you know. I mean, for me, 
because we're so used to different means of communication. But you, you still, there's no substitute for the personal touch of a letter, right? Or um, a personal visit. I remember years ago, I, w- I went to visit someone. I'll never forget this. When I visited a person, and then um, they had said to me, they said, well, that's cool that your church still does house calls because there's no substitute for a personal visit. And I, m- I remember that. There's no substitute for a personal visit. Well, there's no substitute for a letter. Well, this is not going to be the nicest letter, though. He wrote a letter the second time to them, saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my, unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come, come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. He says, Okay, you guys want to serve me? You don't want to go to war with me? Then all of Ahab's sons cut their heads off, and I want you to bring their heads and pile them up into like a pyramid shape at the gate of the city. And they said, yes, sir. Just like Pastor Mark said, he didn't want to get ahead of the story. What he said? Oh, you just got it, no. We'll draw a picture after. Verse 7, And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slew seventy persons and put their heads in baskets and sent him, sent him them to Jezreel. So they cut their heads off. You say, well, how do we know that there are all wicked and deserving of of that. You know, we don't know, but we know that God's in control. And when God allows something and has something done, that's his business. Sometimes people will, you know, you've ever had someone that tries to almost like put God on the on the judgment seat and say things like, how can God allow the people in Africa who've never heard the gospel, to go to hell. And then you would say something like that to the person. Or you burdened for those in Africa? Well, then maybe you should be a missionary. And go. A lot of times they will say those things, but they won't make any attempt to go next door and tell somebody, to to tell the person next door how to be saved. But they're going to put God on the judgment seat and accuse God of sending someone to hell that never heard the gospel who's on the other side of the world, not even understanding the whole situation of what God has done to reach that person. I mean, God went to great lengths to leave the glories of heaven to come down to this sinful world to die for our sins. And then people will accuse God of not being loving and not being fair. Fair? Do we want what is fair? If we got what was fair, we would be going to hell. So we may not understand all the, the, the things, that the reasons why God does what he does, but we can trust that God can take care of his business. No problem. We have a problem sometimes with just taking care of our own business. So anyway, I know that when we see something like this, it's like, wow, that's kind of harsh. But anyway, we may not always understand God, but we know that, in fact, we're never going to fully be able to understand everything about God. If we did, he wouldn't be worth worshiping. So the Bible says his ways are above our ways. So in verse 9, and it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, ye be righteous, behold, I conspired against my master and, and slew him, but... Who slew all these? I didn't. Did I miss a verse? I'm sorry. Let's, verse 7. Verse 7 again. And it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and and sent him them to Jezreel. And there... And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. So they laid them there. 
And then, verse 9, And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous, behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? He's saying, okay, well, you know what? I killed two kings. Yeah, I put two kings down. But who slew all these? I slew two. Who slew seventy? See what he's saying? He's saying that you guys are never going to be able to blame me or, or to look down upon me for killing two kings when you've killed 70. <laughs> you did more than me. So he kind of set him up. Yeah, he's saying that, hey, I mean, if someone's going to say, hey, we, we can't serve Jehu. I mean, he's wicked. He killed two kings. Oh, I killed two kings? Look at how many you killed. You killed 70. And these kings, I mean, they were wicked. I mean, some of these guys, I mean, you don't even know what they did wrong. Yeah, but you told us. Hey, you still did it. <laughs> so that's what he's doing. Who slew all these? Verse 10. Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. He says, but understand this. When God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. Mark it down. If God says that all of Ahab's sons are going to die, and there's not going to be one, a male one that, as it says in the Bible, pisseth against the wall, that they are all going to be put down. That there's not going to be a descendant of Ahab that rules. When God says that, you mark it down. It will come to pass. Judgment is enacted. It happened just like God prophesied. And that's what the Bible says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. When God says, In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Sometimes we may, we may forget. Sometimes we may think that God has forgotten. But God has never forgotten. Because he's not slack concerning his promise. The Bible says in Titus 1-2, In hope of eternal life, that God, who cannot lie, hath promised before the world began. Now, that's a long time ago, before the world began. But when he makes a promise before the world began, he's going to enact it. And judgment here is, in, is enacted. It happened, just like God said. So it's what he said. Know that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord. Everything that God says is going to happen, will happen. He says he's coming back. He's coming back. He says that he's going to set up the millennial kingdom and we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to be in heaven one day, just like he said. And when God said it, there's a, there was a saying before that God said, it, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And someone said, eh, that's weak. God said it, that settles it. <laughs> whether I believe it or not. You know, there are people that laugh about certain things that we as Christians say, or they laugh about some things that the Lord has said. But just like, you remember when um, God's, God told Abraham that he's going to have a son, and Sarah laughed? And then she said, I didn't laugh. And he goes, 
No. You did laugh. And God, if he wanted to, he could have replayed that, that video back, you know. But when they had a child, they had to name him Laughter, right? Because God always gets the last laugh. And maybe it was God's way of saying, well, he thought it was funny, so every time you call his name, maybe you'll be reminded that when I say something, it's going to happen. This is one of those, those verses. Look at um, Second Peter. just thought of it, and so I forgot to share it. Share it with you. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days. By the way, we are living in the last days. Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, right? Walking after their own lusts and saying, this is what, they, this is what they're saying. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're saying, you always say he's coming. I mean, you drive down, what is it, uh, Middle Street, and you see the sign that says, Jesus coming soon. And I'm sure there's people saying, man, I saw that sign all my life. And I've seen that sign pretty much all my life. I remember when, when one time we, and I know you, I, you heard this many times, but it's still a cool story. I was, we, we were coming down School Street, Middle Street. Is it Middle Street, yeah? Middle Street, coming to School Street. And um, my stepbrother seen that. <gasps> Look, Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> hey. I was like, what, what, what? Jesus is coming soon. And I remember, my, you know, my dad was like, well, it's a sign's been up there for a long. But it was, he was excited. Jesus is coming. And you know what? We should always be that excited. That childlike faith, you know. Jesus is coming soon. And it's, that sign is still there. But I bet you there's, a lot of, there's people, a lot of people that, ah, they've been saying that. Like, they've been saying that for, hey, I, and it's, hey, that should encourage us. Because the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be scoffers. So when they start scoffing, you say, hey, you're mentioned in the Bible. I am? Yeah. Where? Where am I mentioned? Right there. Scoffers. <laughs> you can show them. They start to make fun. He goes, oh, hey, you're in the Bible. Really? Yeah. Take them to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Look. You're right there. Scoffer. You're making fun. Man, that's... Wow, that's what. And you can say, thank you. Thank you for encouraging me. It's a reminder to me that God said you're going to say that, and you are. You're fulfilling prophecy. The more you make fun of it, the more you fulfill it. You know God is up in heaven, with, and he has the last laugh. You remember, what's her name, that woman that... um. Shirley McLean, when she was when she was saying that I am, I am God, she was she was saying that like a quote I am God, and she's yelling that out right. I think she's on the beach, you know, saying I, like she's yelling. I didn't want to say it, but I am gone. I'm going to say gone. Okay, and she's I am. Gone, but she's saying, right? And now, and, and there's this comedian or this Christian. Uh, I think he's a preacher. I don't know if he was a comedian too, but he also was a writer, and he was acting it out. He says, "I wonder if when she says that, that to the way God hears it is, and he made a he made a he imitated her voice like a high pitch, like I am gone," and he was saying, "Hey." He said, Michael the Archangel, come listen, listen to this. Listen to this. I am gone. 
And he goes, hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. And he kind of touched the wave a little bit and, you know, knock her down. The guy was just, you know, was making fun. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to them, but I mean, well, maybe I am, I don't know. But. I'm not trying to be, I am. Okay? No. no, but I, you know what I'm saying. I mean, I know they need the Lord. But um, they are in the Bible, and we do know that, that God be true. And every man a lie. In other words, if everyone is saying the same a lie, it does not. You could add another one and another one and another one. It's not going to make it true. It's still a lie. They could all be telling the lies. But God could be the only one saying it, and it's true. And with God, we're always in the majority. Okay, back to our text before we get sidetracked further. You watch, you can be seeing them tonight. Oh, is that me breathing? Oh, this, this thing is loud. What's wrong with this? It's my breathing. Okay. Hello, testing. So where were we? Verse 11. At least you didn't say 36. So Jehu slew all that remain of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests until he left him none remaining. See, God's word is true. And God's word will not return void, the Bible says, right? If you want to help someone, remember this. If you're going to counsel somebody, if you want to encourage somebody, if you're going to disciple somebody, always take them to the Scriptures. Always take them to the Scriptures. I remember one time I was with um, somebody. I was with two people. One person was needing some encouragement or was needing some counseling, I guess you could say. And one of the people was me, and the other person was Brother Mills. And so I remember, honest, true story, we sat down. And I was pouring out my heart out to this person that was needing a word of encouragement or whatever. And I was telling him all kind of good things, wise things. <laughs> so I, as I thought. And I'm just saying this and trying to just really encourage the person. And then I had said, thankfully, I said, hey, Brother Mills, would you like to, um, do you have anything you would like to say? He goes, yes, yes, yes. He goes, what I want to do is I want to, look at the, I want to look at the scriptures. I want to look at a passage I want to share with you. And, man, you could have just felt the power enter the conversation. It was like the Lord kind of said to me, okay, here, let me show you what you should have done. <laughs> and he opened up the scriptures, and it was almost like, I mean, the, the power. So I remembered that. So I, 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 I never forgot that. So the other day, maybe about a couple of months ago, I went to someone's house. This, someone had called me. I was driving down by McDonald's. I was about to go to McDonald's or, I don't know, I was just going to pass McDonald's. And someone called me. And I usually don't answer a phone a number that I don't recognize. I mean, a lot of, nine times out of ten, if you're not on my thing, a lot of times I won't answer, you know. So leave a message. I might check it. No. I'm trying to get better at that, by the way. Sorry. Sorry about that. I shouldn't have disclosed those secrets. But, but for some reason, I answered it. And the person said, you know, is this Pastor Kevin? I got your number from so-and-so. And they told me this like this. It was... Uh, Someone had passed away, and it was one of them really dramatic stories. And they asked if I could come over. I was tired. I thought, man. And I wouldn't have answered, but I said, yeah, the Lord had me answer, so I need, to, I need to go. So I went over to the house. And when I was there, we were all talking, and I wanted to encourage them or give them a word of encouragement. 
wanted to give him a word of counsel or whatever. Biblical advice, I guess you could say. It's, a better, it's better to say biblical advice because counsel, you know. Anyway, just trust me. I wanted to give them some biblical advice. And when I opened the scriptures, and honestly, sometimes I don't really know what scripture to go to. I'm just, one time I really went like this, you know. You want to hear something funny? Well, not funny. But one time there was somebody who was in a hospital. They were in a hospital now. They had something very difficult happen, very difficult happen. I don't want to give away all my secrets, but. So I'm going to read them something, okay? This is just the truth. Just being transparent. I didn't know what to read to them. I, I didn't. And I, I'm going to go in the room. So I thought to myself, okay, God knows what they need. Just open the Bible. Just open, just open the Bible. Just and go like this. And you read it. Imagine if you were um, someone who was, from when you were a little child, one of the things you wanted in your life was to be a mother. And you just received word that you cannot have babies, just like a little while ago. And you were not taking it, you know, it was a shock. And you were very, 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 very sad. You know, that you no longer, the doctor says you cannot have children. And then your pastor comes in. And says, "Eeny, meeny, miny, mo." I mean, you don't know he said that, but I trust that they'll never see this. <laughs> and this is what the pastor reads, because he just went, "Eeny, meeny, miny, mo." I mean, I didn't really say "eeny, meeny," you know, but I just I opened it like I explained to you how I did it. And this is <laughs> no, I got it. This is what I read. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And I'm thinking, I seriously thought, I should have gave this more thought. And I was like, I didn't know whether to read more. <laughs> I didn't know what direction. Were. It's like my mind went blank. I didn't even know anything of what the text said. I just thought, let's pray. <laughs> this person was not thrilled about the passage I selected. Neither was the husband. They were like, they actually, I think, looked at each other and like, for real? For real? For real? I was like, for real? He was like, I was, I'm 5'7". Well... Maybe I'm shrinking, but I was like, I was like about four two after. But you want to know something interesting? That passage has become this family's life verse. If I could read to you, maybe I should. Should I? What you, you guys got anything going on tonight? <laughs> Can I find it even? It's not good at finding anything nowadays. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> this is me texting this individual. Hey, do you remember what verse that was <laughs> that I read to you and your wife when she was in the hospital? I didn't even remember it. 
He sends the, the verse that I just shared with you. This is, this, is, this is what he said. I'll never forget it. I cannot tell you how much I question the Lord's leading to you, leading you with that scripture at that moment. Considering where my wife and I was at the time and how she had been shutting me and everyone out until you asked to visit. But I knew his word and trusted you as the shepherd the Lord entrusted our care to under Christ. Throughout the surgery, verse 5 carried me. When the surgery went well and we began to consider the this particular procedure that they had done, and it was verse 6 that reaffirmed who we trusted in and his faithfulness. Thank you for your obedience, your obedience and your faithfulness to his word. Also your faithfulness to do hospital visits. You know what that shows you? Even in our negligence, God's word stands true. I mean, we're talking, it's like, God's word. So knowing that, reading it at this now this other story I was saying with these people that had called up, we're all in a circle. And I open up the scriptures and I open it up to first John chapter three. I, I don't really even remember. I didn't even know why either, but I just felt drawn to it. And I read that. You could feel the power in that room. And there was someone there that was very opposed to. Christianity into what I was reading. You could feel that. So what am I saying? I'm saying this, that God's word has the power. So if you want to help somebody, I mean, I'm not saying do the eeny, meeny, miny, mo method. I mean, I've <laughs> sensed, you know, but, but I know this, that the word of God is quick and, sharp, and is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, yeah. piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints of the marrow, and is a discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Use the scriptures. That's why the Bible says this, that God tells us to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you the reason of the hope which is in you with meekness and fear. Use the word of God. You know, the Bible says this, that... Um, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's, it helps. It profits. And so we need to know the Word of God. That's why the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And the Word of God, it does the job. And so when God says that judgment is going to fall, this is going to happen, we see Jehu, and Jehu was not, a super great guy. But Jehu knew when God says something, it's going to happen. So we see in the enacting of judgment. Now we see incomplete obedience. What I mean by that? Jehu was not sincere in his heart. He did what God said, but he didn't do it with his whole heart. And so we see that God uses people God will use people to do the things that, he's, that he asks us to do. You know, anybody in here can follow the book of Proverbs. You can follow the book of Proverbs and have a successful business. You can follow the book of Proverbs and have a relatively successful marriage. You could follow the book of Proverbs and you could raise your children in the correct way in a lot of ways. Because you could follow the things that the Bible says. And, but yet, if you do not know the Lord, obviously you're not going to make it to heaven. But if you obey the principles in the scriptures, there's going to be a lot of things that goes your way. Because, because God's word is true. And, and, he's going, and he's going to bless his word. And so Jehu was that way. He did what God said, but he didn't do it with a whole heart. So God blessed what Jehu did, but God didn't bless Jehu because he didn't do it with a sincere heart. It was incomplete. Like, in other words, you can go witness, and you can give out the gospel. You can give someone a track. And God's word can, uh, um, will do the job. You could present the gospel to somebody, 
And I believe that you could present the gospel to somebody and that person could get saved, even if the person presenting it is not. Because of God's word. So that's Jehu. That's how Jehu is. He was not the real deal. There was a message years ago that our wrestling coach preached, and it was entitled, as a message that whoever heard it would never forget it. It was entitled, Jehu, Jonah, and You. And he talked about that very thing was his point. Here you have Jonah preached, and they had a great revival, but Je- Jonah didn't love the people of Nineveh. And then he used um, Jehu, same thing. And then he said, what about you? Oh, it was powerful, yeah? He says, are you real? We're here. You know, I could say that tonight, right? Are you real? Am I real? Why am I here? Like, um, is the reason you're here out of, a, out of a pure motive, or you just had to be here, right? So, anyway, Jehu, incomplete obedience, like he obeyed what God said, but not f- from the heart. We got to be true to, our, to, to the Lord, and we need to be sincere. Okay, so he said, so as we continue on. What verse are we on? Just seeing if you were paying attention. And he arose and departed and came to Samaria, and he was at the shearing house in the way. Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king of the of the children, wait, what's it? We we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the of the queen. And he said, "Take them alive." And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men. Neither left he any of them, as he was like I said, cleaning house. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab the son of Rechab coming to meet him, and he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave, and he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. I mean, he's an arrogant person. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Hey, Charles, watch this, man. Hey, watch how I do things. I'm the man. You see, he just said that. And this guy, um, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, do you remember the Rechabites? You remember them? Rechabites? They were the ones that were, they were really sincere people. And so here's someone who is really sincere, and here you got Jay, or, or from that descendants, and then you have Jehu, someone who's not, but then he's acting like he's the, he's the man. You know, if someone got to tell you they're, they're the man, they're not the man. If someone got to tell you how great that they are, they're not too great, right? What did Jesus say? He said that those that are great among you shall be your what? Servants. Does, does Jehu, do you get the impression that he's much of a servant? You, you get the impression that he's someone that is what they, what they used to call it in when I was playing football, prima donna. Our coach, Coach Watanabe, used to say that. We don't got any prima donnas around here. You know, I didn't even know what that what meant. I said, I know, I heard a Madonna. She's a singer. Prima donna, I guess someone that's like trying to be a Madonna. I don't know. I didn't know what, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't the brightest son. Uh, <laughs> It wasn't the, the brightest flashlight in the, in the toolbox. <laughs> but so you, you see Jehu. He's like, watch me, man. Watch what I'm going to do. Where was I again? Was that? Co- you are correct. See? I just wanted you to feel good about yourself. <laughs> oh, I could just look up there too, yeah. Like I said, like I said. Verse 17, and when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained under Ahab in Samaria till he destroyed him, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which he spake to Elijah. 
And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now, was he just being sarcastic? Was he just trying to say that? Or was he really wanting to serve Baal? I mean, I, really, I honestly don't. A lot of people say that he was just saying that. But you just don't get the impression that Jehu is a very godly person. Jehu shall serve him much. I don't even think you should joke about that, right? Even if it was something he was joking about. Now, therefore, call unto me all the prophets. And some say he's just trying to trick them, you know, and maybe that's part of it. I, I, I really honestly don't know or I'm not sure. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, and all his priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel. And all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. So he's, of course, getting them all to come together, right? So he could destroy them. And Jehu, but you'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see Jehu and the kind of person he is. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search, and look, that there be here with with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men without, without, and said, If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life shall be for the life of him. Make sure they all get killed. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said, to the guard and to the captains, go in and slay them. Let none, let none come forth. And, he, and they smote them with the edge of the sword. And the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a drop. A draught house unto this day. That's basically a restroom, I guess you could say. A sewer plant, actually. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Now that is good, right? How be it? See? How be it? From the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, it's like, what is the deal? <laughs> Who is this guy, Jehu? How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. <laughs> so he continued to worship idols. You see? No, yes, it looks good, right? But was his heart in these false worships? I mean, was it that he would say, you don't do it, right? You know what? What if I was to say, you know what, Pastor Mark, you should, you, you got to stop drinking, man. You got to stop. You got to stop drinking, man. In fact, you know what? Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that alcohol there. Oh, it's your mom's. <laughs> Give me that. Mm. And then, 
That's kind of what he was doing. You, you appear so hardcore, right? You appear so hardcore. And yet you're leading a nation in idolatry still. And you're the king. Here, just drink it. I mean, doesn't that just frustrate you? When you read that? That's why the point is incomplete obedience. But can you imagine when the Lord looks down upon us sometimes? The things we tell people to not do or to do. You know, when you point a finger like this, right? That's why I go like this. No? <laughs> Even the thumb. You guys. <laughs> you. Because even us looking down upon Jehu can be, right? That's why, you know the best bet, the best bet when you're working with people, when you're helping people, always, always, always. You want to write this down, what I'm about to say? I forgot what I was going to say. I get hit when you know, I got hit. I forget things now. What was it? It was so important. Always. 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 Oh, okay, here it is. Always be humble. Otherwise, you're going to be like Jehu. It's always better to say, you know what? You need to be this way. You know what? Sometimes I struggle with that myself. I remember one time when I was, when Pastor Bentley, one of the first times he came to visit, I was so nervous. You remember that? Jensen was here. Because, you know, Pastor Bentley is so um, conservative, very, very conservative, 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 conservative people say, oh, he's conservative. And then, you know, he's coming here and sometimes the culture is very expressive here, you know. And I just thought, I just don't know how he's going to feel. And this is like Roxanne's the church she grew up in. And I just was a little bit nervous, you know. I shouldn't have been, but I just was. How, how is he going to? How is he going to feel here, you know, the different culture, right? I mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? So what does he do? He meets Jensen. And I forget what Jensen told him a joke. And I was like, oh, Jensen. Jensen, please don't talk to Pastor Bentley. Do you remember the joke you thought? I forget what it was, but it's like. And then Yuki tells him, shut up. Remember when he used to say that? She used to say that. that was, Shut up. But you know when Pastor Bentley came here? He's sitting down and he starts talking to August. And he says to August, he says, Hey, can I ask you something? There's a guy in our church that's struggling with this kind of addiction. And what, how would you advise him since it's something, you know, you guys do a lot? So that way I can learn. He's trying to learn from us. I thought, this man is a humble man. You know, one time I told him, I said, there was something that happened in the church at that time, and I thought, I'll just ask him what would, you know. I said, Pastor Bentley, man, I really, I really messed up. I really messed up. It's like the first time I messed up, in, a, you know, in years. <laughs> I said, I made this mistake or whatever, and I seen. And you know what he said? He goes, you know what? I did the same thing, too, when I was, when I was a pastor. He said that those kind of things happen, those kind of things. And I thought, what a humble man. I learned from that. That's why I'm so humble today. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, hey, always be humble when you're going to help people. Because sometimes we, we try to help them and we act like we've arrived. I mean, we can do that. And that's, be careful. He says, you know what? You need to stop doing that, you know, because I'm perfect. You need to be perfect too. <laughs> Always remember, be humble, be humble. 
Because we can have a tendency, if not, we can be like, we can forget and we can start being like Jehu. Telling people, don't worship idols, and then he worships idols. I mean, as we say in Pigeon, for real? For real? So he, Jehu departed not. He continued to do the idolatry. Mm. <clears throat> it's frustrating, man. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine house, and I mean in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. He said, you know what? God still blessed the things that he did that was right. <laughs> God still blessed him. I mean, thank God for the mercy of God and the long-suffering of God. And there was a benefit because of the things that he did. He was obedient, but it was an incomplete obedience. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, to walk in the, the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Incomplete obedience. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Hazel smote them in all the coasts of Israel. From Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from Aror, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu, and all that he did, and all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehoaz, his son, reigned in his stead. And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel and Samaria was twenty and eight years. The last point is insincere worship. Insincere worship. Do you remember what the sin of Jeroboam was? I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the sin of uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That caused Israel to sin. You remember what is what what he did? Do you remember what he did? Right, he he erected those those golden calves. He put one in the no, the northern area of the. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, right? You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and you had Dan that actually was down here, and they actually laughed and moved their area. And so what um, Jeroboam did was he put those golden calves. He had two, right? He put one in the north in Dan, and he put one in Bethel, because that was the southernmost. So, like, if this is Israel, and then you have Galilee area, then you have Samaria, and then you have Judea. This area up here, you have Dan, let's say over here, and you have Bethel down here. This area, he put a golden calf up here, and then he put a Golden calf down there. See? So, right there, and right there. Right there. <laughs> one in the north, one in the south. Why? Oh, who can tell? I know we got to close. I know you got to close. Why did he do that? Anybody remember? Good job, Judith. He didn't want his people. I mean, I know a lot of you knew it, but but Judith was the first one to say it. Farrington grad, they they sharp man. No, you see, she was she was a Farrington grad, and she struggled. But now when she came to church, then I helped her. To, Castle Grant helped her to be smart. Wow. So you're smart now because I helped you. Yeah. I'm just joking. I remember I got to be humble. I forgot. <laughs> anyway, she's exactly right. See, the king, relax, Judith, relax. He did not want them to go south to Jerusalem because that's where they're supposed to go three times a year. They had to go. That was a. That, they, 
they were commanded, all the males, to go to Jerusalem three times a year to worship. He didn't want them to do that. So he said, you don't need to do that. Just go to these golden calves. Remember the golden calves that, I mean, this happened before, you know, problems sometimes if we don't learn from history, we're going to force to repeat it. And so then now is when Aaron and company built that golden calf. So now here you have Jeroboam does the same thing and says, now we just go over here. You don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem. You don't have to do that. That was what they were commanded to do, and you only worshipped at the temple. So now he says, you know what? No, you don't need to go to the, all the way down there. We got a place for you to go. It's more convenient. It's easier. And that way we can, we can maintain our people. We can keep the crowds. Do we still see that in churches today? You know, we don't want to have church only on this particular... We want it to be... What, when, what is easier for you? What is it easy? Friday? What, what, what day? What's better? You know, and, and what, too long? You don't want it to be too long? Yeah, what, why don't you just like maybe on your way home from work, you know, stop by and, you know, on Friday or so and, and just come in, you know, and, and uh, maybe it's real fast, fast kind, in, in sincere worship. That's not even worship. Worship is sacrifice. He's worthy. He's worthy of my time. He's worthy of me making the journey all the way from up here to down there. It, 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 he's worthy of me giving of myself. But Jeroboam said, nah, no. We just let me come easy. Insincere worship. And that's what we see in this chapter. We don't want to have that. We want, you know, when you, you think about how many days of the week, how many days, you know, we'd say, let's say seven days, and let's just say it at, at our church, we, we worship on Sunday, and we say, you know what? Let's give the Lord Sunday. No, I'm not, not in a legalistic way, but I'm, I'm just saying for us at our church, we worship on Sunday. You know, technically, you can worship any day of the week. It doesn't have to be Sunday, right? But the pattern in the Bible that was set before us, they did on Sunday, we, and we kind of followed that pattern. You know, and it's the beginning of the week, right? And it's the first day of the week, Sunday. It's good to start off the week, right? Putting the Lord first. And so, you know, we have, these are good reasons. But really, you can worship Wednesday. It's Wednesday, right? Why do we worship on Wednesday? It's in the middle of the week. Because, you know, sometimes, I mean, man, you get, start working in your job and you, you know, you kind of like, you know, living in this world and, it's, you know, it's, it's good to come together in the middle of the week, kind of, re, you know, just get refreshed, right? So, but the thing about it is worship is a sacrifice. It should cost. It should be difficult in a way sometimes. That's what well, he's worthy of our time, right? So, hey, let's just give the Lord these times to worship because he's worthy. He's more worthy than my boss. Well, I mean, my boss is, but, you know, I mean. He's more worthy than even my family, right? He's more worthy, name something. He's more worthy than my extracurricular activities, right? He's wor- That's what worship is. But that insincere worship, and that's what we see in this chapter, the problem. The reign of Jehu. In acting judgment, God's word will not return void. In complete obedience, they didn't get down into his heart, right? He did the right thing, but he didn't do it with his whole heart. And then, insincere worship. Now, when we think about Jesus, I mean, here you have the perfect, and Jesus never sinned. And he did what he did with his whole heart. When he went to the cross, he did it. For you and for me, he had the right. He did it for the right reasons. That he was a true servant of God. He he sincerely did what he did because of his love for us. And basically, what we need to be is not like Jehu, not like Jonah, but like Jesus. You know, Brother Hazewinkle could have added that. You know, Jehu, Jonah, and you. And Jesus. And he would even have kept the alliteration too. Anyway. 
Jesus died on the cross for us because judgment is coming upon us. But he took it upon himself so that we could go free. He was totally obedient as he said, he does always all, all those things that please his heavenly father. And he is sincere all the way through and through. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.